Hello, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this week's ITNTD Connect meeting. If we haven't met before, I'm Marianne Compred from the International Society for Neglected Tropical Diseases. And today, as part of our series on all things infectious and tropical diseases, we're going to be taking a closer look at climate and health. And moving slightly away from that relationship in terms of pollution or heat stress, non-communicable diseases, we're going to be speaking more specifically about climate sensitive infectious diseases and what we need to better understand that relationship that despite the definite recent increase in attention, in many ways still remains a bit of a black box and even more so when thinking beyond the vector-borne infectious diseases. So to guide us through the current gaps in those complex relationships along that health and climate nexus, but also to help us get a better sense of the existing tools and those still needed to facilitate drawing on these dynamics of the climate to better understand and all importantly predict outcomes in infectious diseases. And um, spoiler alert, with a very exciting announcement coming up too, it's our immense pleasure to welcome today's panelists. And firstly, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Anna stewart Tibara. Hi, Anna. Hi, uh, thank you, welcome. Uh, Dr. Sadie Ryan, hi. Madeleine Thompson, Welcome Trust. Uh, Bilal Mateen, also from the Welcome Trust. Uh, huge pleasure to have you all. Thank you so much. Uh, it's going to be a very exciting session. And of course, the meeting wouldn't be uh, what it is without our wonderful international audience. Uh, so please don't hesitate to say hello in the chat thread and let us know where you're connecting from, your country, organization, and of course, any questions or comments which you may have for our speakers today ahead of our discussion coming up after this presentation. Um, so this session coincides quite closely with the recent launch of a report, Landscaping Software Tools for Climate Sensitive Infectious Disease Modeling, as well as a funding call in this domain. This has all been happening very recently. It's hot off the press. So without any further delay, another very warm welcome to everyone connected today. Um, yeah, so uh, Madeleine Thompson, uh, as I said, from the Wellcome Trust, and I just wanted to say a couple of words about why we at the Wellcome Trust are interested in this space and interested in supporting uh, the research community in developing uh, climate-sensitive infectious disease modelling tools. You will be hearing uh, from our colleagues that um, responded to an RFP that we put out last year uh, to landscape this area. And uh, they've been working on this for the last six months. And Anna and Sadie, who are here with us, will be presenting that report. Uh, before uh, they do that, however, for those of you who are not so familiar with the Welcome Trust, we have gone through a major change over the last uh, two years. Welcome is a, is a major uh, research, a medical research funder based in London, the UK. We spend about, at the moment, about a billion a year on medical and health research. And uh, we have for many years um, been working under the vision and mission of achieving extraordinary improvements in health by funding the brightest minds. Over the last two years, however, we've had this major science review and based on that science review, major reorganization towards a new vision, which is about supporting science to solve the urgent health challenges facing everyone. And uh, like I said, for us as, a, as an institute, this is a very big shift. It means that we're much more interested in seeing how the research impacts um, health in the, in the real world um, and focusing particularly on a number of health challenges. So I'll just share this diagram with you, which is how we see our new structure. Uh, historically, we have funded uh, extensively what we would call discovery research, uh, really looking for significant shifts in our understanding that could improve human health over the long term. And uh, you could say uh, Wellcome's investment in genomics uh, has now supported a lot of COVID response, um, certainly here in the UK, but also uh, globally. Under the new structure, we're going to continue investing in discovery research, but instead of a myriad of projects 
um, surrounding that discovery research as we had previously, we're now going to channel our efforts in three major challenge, challenge areas. These are infectious disease, climate and health, and mental health. And what we see from the discussion uh, and the presentations that we'll have today is really our first uh, call uh, under this new structure, um, where we link the work of climate and health with our cross-cutting data for science and health team, which uh, my colleague Bilal uh, Martin represents and will um, explain a, a bit more about. And so uh, what I would like to, to say is we're delighted to be here and not only just be here and share a new opportunity coming from the Wellcome Trust, but actually say this is a first of its kind and we're very excited um, to have been able to create a new initiative um, in this space. And now I'm just going to pass it over to Anna, who will take us through the report that underpins uh, the call that Bilal will uh, present. So over to you, Anna. Thanks, Madeline. So good morning and good afternoon to everyone. And today we're going to be sharing our findings and recommendations from a project that we did with the Wellcome Trust to landscape the availability of and need for software tools to model the relationship between climate and infectious diseases. So over the next 30 minutes or so, we'll present findings from this report and then we'll have time for discussion. Our team was composed of multidisciplinary researchers working at the forefront of climate sensitive infectious diseases. Dr. Sadie Ryan, our technical lead who is with us today from the University of Florida. Kat Lippi, also from the University of Florida. Rachel Lowe from LSHTM, Avriel Diaz from Columbia University, Willie Dunbar from Florida International University, and we were joined by Shruti Grover and Simon Johnson from HECO Design, who played a key role in automating the lit review and communicating our findings. In the following slides, we'll share a brief overview of the aims of the project and our approach. There were three main parts to this project. First, we conducted a systematic review of the literature on climate and infectious diseases to identify existing modeling tools and exemplars. We then interviewed science experts involved in tool development and policy experts involved in climate and health work to identify opportunities to improve the creation and use of modeling tools. We'll provide more details in the following slides. Now I'll pass the floor to Sadie. So one of the first things we needed to do was think about what would be the ideal tool. Um, and so we thought about what are the characteristics of the tool? Obviously we wanted it to incorporate both climate inputs and epidemiological information and to produce an output as a prediction or indicator of disease. And we wanted that all to be in one package. But in addition to that, in order for the stakeholders to be able to find and actually use these tools, we needed them to be transparently described and validated. In order to achieve these sorts of um, added benefits, we also needed them to be named so that people could find them in the future and so that versioning would also be transparent. Lastly, we needed it to be accessible. We need the code to be published or available on a code repository, a web platform or other format. And so in order to take on this landscaping approach, we did a rather large um, automated review in quite a short time. And so what we did is we did this automated scrape um, where we, can, we put together a list of key terms and then we ran 150 search terms through the PubMed API. And that's where our colleagues at HETCO helped us automate this. And we came up with 30,000 unique publications. Obviously that's a lot. And so we used the MeSH terms, the medical subject heading terms from PubMed to screen these for irrelevant papers and to shortlist that to 9,500 papers. We then shortlisted these even further, and we ended up with our entire review team taking on a lot of papers uh, with 242 publications in which tools were mentioned and identified. We then looked further into this and did a deep dive to find out where we might see operationalized tools, and we confirmed about 62 potential tools, but for completing our criteria, we found 37 op unique operationalized tools. We then also conducted semi-structured interviews with 21 interviews ultimately from 10 countries. And so I'm just going to do a, a 
large overview of the primary findings. Um, we identified very few robust evidence-led operationalized models. The vast majority of those we did find were for vector-borne disease systems. Only about a quarter of these ultimately were, were designated potentially useful for decision makers, and a majority of the tools existed only for where, con where countries where the conditions are endemic. This means that for emerging situations, there may not be as many tools available, and that's an important thing to think about. So to take a little bit of a further dive into this, through the systematic review, as we said, we only identified 37 tools that met our criteria. This was really shockingly small um, because there is a large body of climate and infectious disease modeling literature. And so this suggests that there's sort of this gap. There's very few models that actually make it to that operationalized stage and sort of move into that next stage of tool development. In our candidate list, several of the models had quite a lot of the criteria. There were freely accessible model outputs, but there weren't code repos or there were platforms, but it was hard to replicate those platforms. So in these two illustrations on this point, the outputs are well described in the publication and there's online hosting for some of the outputs for the first one, um, but variations on the types of R code to actually implement them is scattered across multiple related publications. So this makes it unable for the user to follow a straightforward pipeline. This means that utility of these models have required other agencies to directly contact the authors and bring them in on the work. Um, and so someone who's a non-expert at programming and software or without the dedicated support and funding, this falls short of the need for implementation. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was make recommendations to funders um, about how to think about what could be targeted. And so we think that it would be useful to target grants to help transition validated models into publicly available repositories following these rules that we've established for our ideal tools. Our second finding was that the majority of the tools identified in our review focused on vector-borne disease systems. This means that there's a vast overrepresentation of vector-borne diseases, and there's a shortage of tools available for respiratory, food-borne, soil-borne, and water-borne diseases. Only 10% of the tools, in fact, were developed for other kinds of infectious diseases. And this means that there needs to be hopefully a directed focus towards other diseases. And on this slide, you can see um, the pathogens that we were targeting with our literature review. And the blue boxes show pathogens with existing tools. And if we think about those that are you know, thought to be some of the most important by major bodies of global health, we found that even a priority pathogen like Ebola, there was not a satisfactory tool in amongst our findings. And this was a massive surprise to our team, as we thought we would find a lot more tools and a lot more coverage of these important pathogens. And therefore, based on this finding, our further recommendation is to really target those tools that we did not see, those for respiratory, foodborne, soilborne, and waterborne climate-sensitive infectious diseases, to be able to ensure preparedness for the next pandemic. And I will now pass this back to Anna for some more of our findings. Thanks, Sadie. So our third primary finding was that of the 37 tools, only one quarter had legible interfaces that could be potentially useful for decision makers. And only 8% were deployment ready with detailed guides for use. And the target audience of the remaining tools, about two thirds of all the tools, appears to be researchers. There are obvious limitations in the approach of assessing tools through, through focusing only on a legible interface. But in general, we can conclude that very few studies progressed from providing the initial evidence of climate and health linkages to the operationalization of a decision support tool that could inform actions to reduce the burden of disease. 
Just to clarify, this is an example of what we mean by operationalization. On the left, you can see what we consider to be a legible interface from the Hydromats tool, a hydrology, entomology, and malaria transmission simulator for West Africa. And on the right, you see a GitHub repository for OMAWA, an R package for malaria warning, which would make little sense to the average decision maker. Interestingly, what surfaced in the interviews was that working on a project which had an implementing organization as a key partner was a completely different playing field. For example, in our experience working in close partnership with the health and climate sectors in Barbados, the tool that our team co-developed has gone much further than tools that we've worked on in other places, in large part because the local implementing partners have driven the process from determining the disease of interest and the need for a tool to the appropriate time scale of the forecast and the ideal delivery platform of the tool. This partnership also led to new innovations in impact-based forecasting and the communication of risk and uncertainty. This means that the question of implementing the tool or the last mile problem really needs to be addressed from the onset, outset. Transitioning research to public health practice must be accounted for from the beginning of the design of the tool, since the model input and output need to align with the decision-making processes identified by public health professionals who would use the tool. Interestingly, most of the tools that were identified as potentially useful for decision makers were funded by an institutional or country level partner. The e-risk mapper by University of Oxford is a bit of an exception, and it was developed as a user-friendly Windows package over the past two decades by the University of Oxford and is used by the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. Based on this finding, our recommendation is to fund multi-partnership transdisciplinary teams to ensure that researchers and end users co-create the tools, eliminating this so-called last mile problem. And we can also make efforts to identify the exemplar public facing partners who are leading the way in the implementation of these tools. Our final primary finding was that most tools were developed for and implemented in geographic areas where the infectious disease of interest was, is currently endemic. The tools have been implemented in several WHO regions spanning Africa, the Americas, Europe, Western Pacific, Southeast Asia, and the Eastern Mediterranean, and several tools were global. This suggests the need for tools for regions where the risk of infectious diseases is projected to increase under future climate change scenarios and areas where the risk is already increasing, these so-called zones of disease emergence. For example, in this study by Dr. Sadie Ryan and colleagues, they projected that under the worst case climate change scenario, within the next century, nearly a billion people are expected to be threatened by new exposure to viruses transmitted by Aedes mosquitoes, affecting diseases like dengue fever, Zika, and chikungunya. This means that suitability for some regions will increase and other regions will decrease. We are already seeing the emergence of Aedes transmitted diseases in temperate latitudes like the southern cone of South America and higher elevations in the tropical Andes. Just last year, Argentina experienced the worst dengue epidemic on record, but it went largely unnoticed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Based on this finding, we believe that there's the potential to li link countries that are currently experiencing epidemic transmission and have experienced developing and implementing tools to address disease threats to countries that are experiencing the emergence of new diseases. And we suggest funding projects that cross pollinate between regions that are currently affected and those that are in zones of emergence to allow for sharing of best practices. And we also identified to explore the question of which regions are the most or least prepared to forecast infectious diseases under changing climate conditions. Sadie? So I'll now go through some secondary findings that we had from this report. And at a large view, these are a need for greater representation of the global south, a need for tools at a variety of spatial scales, because we found that few models forecast beyond the seasonal outlook. And we also found that health sectors don't always have a mandate to focus on climate impact yet. And this is important because if you don't have a mandate, you don't think about bringing together these two groups easily within the existing structures. So firstly, North American and European institutions were disproportionately represented in the production of the tools. There were 102 institutions represented in the author list of the 48 publications screened in our review, 
to get down to that 37 set of tools, but only a third of these institutions, or sorry, a third of these institutions were based in the USA or UK. And so in some cases, you even have the model named after a Northern research body rather than after the location it is studying and where it's implemented. And to go a little further with this, um, this interesting network diagram created by our HETCO partners shows where these institutions are sort of bridging the global um, field of where these tools exist. And so LSHTM seems to be acting as a bridge between North America and the Asia and Pacific regions. The Norwegian Institute of Health sort of acts as a conduit for this networking of authorship into Scandinavian institutions. And Africa and South and Central America are largely underrepresented, but there are institutions that are building outreach such as the University of Florida. And there seems to be an entirely separate sort of network um, of authorship and tool development with Liverpool University at the center, reaching out to North America and Asia and Pacific and Africa. And so we're seeing this sort of very um, clumped set of researchers largely at the center of these research tools. So our next finding was that the spatial scale of tools in our final list varied considerably. These ranged from very localized, so thinking about tools that work for individual villages, to tools with global or continental extents. And tools that are very localized may have fairly limited transferability even though they may have the benefit of being very well validated locally. And so this may lead to more accurate predictions for local health authorities. Conversely, the tools with those very coarse resolutions may be able to address you know, larger scales, but they might be of limited use to local stakeholders. So it's really important to encourage models at different scales to help facilitate the kinds of decision-making that happens at these different granularities. Within our tools that we identified, some examples of local tools include Anaspex, SLIM, and FleaTick Risk, while other tools such as Mara and the Vibrio Viewer in the ECDC and Albapictus package were at continental scales, which may be less actionable for local stakeholders. And so we were asking how, how might welcome direct funding also um, towards spatial scale diversity and I will pass this back to Anna. Sure. Thanks, Sadie. So we also found that climate input data and the temporal scale of the model output was an important aspect that we needed to consider. Most of the studies use gridded climate data as inputs for making model predictions. Temperature and precipitation were the most commonly used climate indicators. And most models were developed to forecast disease risk at the seasonal time scale. This revealed a lack of sub-seasonal and long-term forecasting tools, and we believe that tools should be developed across a range of timescales to respond to different decision-making needs of the health sector. Researchers and decision-makers agreed that useful tools lack sustainability without having the backing of political will. They also shared that before the, polit before the political mandate, information sessions on the importance of multi-sectoral dynamic collaboration would be key to bring everyone on the same page. Interviewees also shared that in some areas, tools that are available and functional are not made operational due to lack of a political mandate, and that this was extremely challenging to navigate and perhaps one of the most important aspects of the project, as the end goals were often uh, to support the creation of these and implementation of national adaptation plans. So many of the experts we spoke to agreed that the political mandates would substantially help to make the operationalization of forecasting tools possible. And the major takeaway is that there is a need to support the creation of institutional and political environments that really facilitate uh, the creation and implementation of these climate informed tools. Handing it back to Bilal. Thanks, Adi and Anna. And this is, I think, the bit that I get super excited about because hopefully everyone in the room, or what's just happened is that everyone in the room has heard the pretty much the same presentation that we got a few months ago and as we sat reflecting on it and the team that I sit in in particular within Welcome thinks about how we fund the new software tools and digital infrastructure that helps us really leverage the increasingly computational nature of 
science and health research that's happening currently was what we heard was that there's an opportunity here, right? There are 37 tools that the team could identify having gone through thousands and thousands of publications. And when you dig deeper into those 37 tools, what I heard from Anna and Sadie is that there's a first mile problem where people are probably doing great research that develops novel methodology, but it's not making its way into a tool that would allow more researchers to use. And you've got this last mile problem um, where where the tools exist, maybe they aren't set up to really address the needs of policymakers. And so in our team, we're always thinking about how can we make sure the technology that we fund both addresses the needs of policymakers and has an impact on human health and well-being, but also through a lens that is making sure that our research funding is equitable and the impacts that we're having, we're having are equitably distributed. Which is why when we put that all together, we went, what we need to do um, is spend some money on solving the problem. Uh, which is what I think funders do best. And so what we announced a couple of weeks ago is a new call, which is a digital technology development award focused on climate sensitive infectious disease modeling. Um, we said that we're going to spend uh, at least 10 million pounds. The way that we're allocating that is that we're asking people to submit proposals of up to half a million pounds. So we're hoping we'll be able to fund about 20 individuals and teams to either develop a new piece of digital technology or digital infrastructure, or to extend something that already exists to make better use of uh, climate information where we know those diseases are climate sensitive. So we were really aware um, every week when we got to have a chat with Sadie and Anna is that they were finding brilliant work that had been done in the space of infectious disease modeling. But that step of introducing the climate information, the climactic factors that we know are relevant, just hadn't been done yet. So we're, we're not excluding anyone. Um, we both want to bring the climate scientists into this. We want to bring those that have classically focused on infectious disease research into this space and go, how can we all work together to create a new set of tools that will catalyze the next generation of research? So that's the call. Um, you can see the QR code uh, on the screen. There is a link. It is hopefully very easy to find and we'll drop it into the chat as well so that you can go there uh, right after the webinar. What I'm hoping we'll do today, and I don't want to take too much time going on about the call because hopefully it's all on the web page, is to say that what we're what we'd really like to do with the next half an hour that we all have together is find out what those in the room think that we can do to add more detail to help guide applicants. So if you have questions where something hasn't been clear, there's an aspect of the report that you disagree with or think that it would be helpful for us to share more detail on. Similarly with the call. Um, if there are aspects that aren't clear, if you've already read the web page that we can help clarify, we'd love to do that. We'd also love to um, have questions about what our opinions are about the themes and challenges relevant to the field. So um, I am absolutely not an expert, but I will throw Madeline under the bus as well as Sadie and Anna and say we have three absolute superstars uh, in the room who I'm sure have opinions that would make for interesting conversation. What I want to be very explicit about is that we unfortunately, because we want to be fair to everyone, be answering questions about the competitiveness of specific ideas and also about individual eligibility. There's a little email address on the screen. It's also on the web page. Uh, feel free to drop us a line. We will gladly answer any questions that we can. Uh, but I'm hoping that what we'll be able to do is surface some information that's going to be useful for everyone. And I'll stop there and invite everyone else back. And let's see if we can't have an interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much to our presenters. Uh, what an exciting time. You've kind of summarized so neatly for us uh, what's missing and also how researchers around the world can really kind of come on board and embrace not just this agenda, but the very practical steps and tools involved. So a huge thank you for that. Uh, on cue, lots of comments and questions have started coming in. Um, and I hope we'll, we'll have a few moments to, to answer those. Just kind of to start off our discussion, um, and it was really interesting that you highlighted this sort of um, no man's land of tools outside of vector-borne diseases. And so uh, for some of our audience that aren't working on climate, but are working on those diseases without any tools, would you have any advice or just uh, any practical recommendations on how they can bring the, the climate dimension, whether it be data, policy framework, kind of all those angles into their work when perhaps they're working on um, 
deworming programs or uh, hand washing, you know, kind of installing piped water and so forth. So maybe we could start there. Can I make a, 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 a real entry point? I think um, quite often people are a bit overwhelmed when they first start looking at climate and, and a, a disease and think that they need to get involved in a really super complicated modeling process and really complicated uh, uh, decisions, et cetera, over the long term. But there's some very practical steps to first identifying whether this is even relevant to the work that you do. And um, the primary place, I think, to think it through is, are the health outcomes that you're focused on and is the program that you're engaged in in any way seasonal? And is that seasonality being driven by the environment? We know there's lots of seasonal processes that are associated with schools opening and closing or with other social uh, activities, but fundamentally, a lot of infectious disease has a cycle and that cycle is driven by the seasonal climate. So that's a first starting point. And even like in, um, uh, I've been, uh, worked quite a lot in Ethiopia, which has a very complicated climate. And you, under, you can see that the seasons are different in different parts of the country. And quite often programs are not organized in a way to deal with that complexity. And climate can illustrate that really easily for you. So you can go all the way from just a really good uh, integrated seasonal tool to a much more complicated uh, infectious disease modeling tool that is bringing in all sorts of different information. And I, I would like us to go uh, back actually and just ask um, Anna and Sadie, in your experience, there's a challenge between simplicity and complexity. Researchers often want to be really complicated because it's really interesting and it makes good papers. But decision makers need to be able to understand the models in order to use them. So where do you feel that balance between complexity and simplicity may lie? Sadie, so you want to jump in first? Sure. Um, so I think that one, one of the things that we've learned over the years um, working together is that the sort of co-development piece of this is absolutely fundamental, that if you don't know what kinds of decisions can even be made, you're not going to be making models that people can use. Mm. And so thinking about, you know, it's, it's great. You know, I, I have a career as a medical geographer. I can make beautiful maps of where diseases are, but who can actually use those maps to make a decision is a completely different type of question. And so this issue of, you know, sort of wonderful complexity of modeling. Yes, we do want to get these scientifically right, right? We do not want to undermine the credibility or the accuracy of this. We do want them to be validated, but then how do those get into the hands of people who can then make an action on the ground to respond to it, to use it, to leverage it, to make you know things like calls for climate health mandates? Um, and so I think I think that sort of it is it is fundamental to really sort of know what are the levers that you're actually talking to. Um, and I'll pass this over to Anna, who can probably say more about that. Sure, thanks, Sadie. So my thinking is that there are ways that you can get started without even diving into the complex modeling, right? Like this starts with getting the right people at the table and talking to each other, having the epidemiologist or the person who works with the disease data sitting next to the person who knows more about the local climate information and creating that dialogue, beginning to share information, to share knowledge. And I always think about uh, the experience in the Caribbean region where they bring together every quarter regional experts on climate and health, and they look at the upcoming seasonal climate forecast, and they issue a series of expert statements about how that will affect um, you know, gastrointestinal disease, mental health, vector-borne disease. And so in that case, there isn't a complex modeling of disease behind it, although there are clearly the climate models, but they are issuing a tool and a product, which is this bulletin that goes out. So the climate tool is not always uh, the result of a complex modeling process. Clearly, there is interest in you know, taking that to the next step, having more specific quantitative estimates of risk. But I think there's a lot that can be done, especially mm -hmm. in the beginning stages, like Matt, Madeline said, when we're sort of sitting, sitting down and starting to talk to each other and bringing together the right people um, to say, you know, if we just meet once a quarter and we look at what's happening with the rainfall and the temperature in the next three months, what do we already know? And how can we share that information with people who need to make health decisions uh, uh, every day? If I could jump in there right at the end and say, I agree with everything that's been said thus far, and I'm seeing some comments um, in the chat 
uh, where people are asking about what our opinions on um, the co-development piece is, which Sadie, I think you've answered really clearly. From the funder's perspective, what I want to add is that we're looking for people to be creative and to think about impact in terms of benefit to human lives. And the only way to really do that is not publish a paper, but to work with decision makers on the ground who are going to implement and use these tools. Um, so when we're looking at these applications, when we're talking to the, the, mm. the experts that we've invited to panel, the question we're asking ourselves is, have you made a good case for how this thing you create is going to catalyze work that is going to help improve people's lives, not will result in a brilliant paper, which I'm sure will be intellectually interesting, um, but really doesn't shift the needle in a field that kind of needs quite urgent attention. And that that's what we're looking for. Um, those impact statements that you have genuinely co-created as you've spoken to people who would use it and you've built the capacity, as other people have, me have mentioned in the chat, uh, that would allow people to use it. Um, there's no point creating something someone needs uh, without also helping them be able to use it for the next 10, 20 years. These are all things in the back of our minds. And I would say that, um, yeah, the questions that everyone that everyone is asking and are asking um, are entirely relevant. And we hope people will reflect in the proposals they submit. And that's very interesting because, as you as you said, Bilal, lots of the comments um, that people are are making are really about. Okay, so now let's. I can see everyone's on board and is really thinking about how do you get all the different parties using these tools, uh, all the way from the kind of high level policy level, but also. Um, in the Q&A, uh, Carlos Texera was mentioning the communities themselves. Uh, not surprisingly, two of our um, kind of vector control specialists, um, Stephen Bremer from Canada, but also uh, Friedrich representing the Global Vector Hub, uh, have brought up this notion of building capacity in vector control for the models themselves to be used. So uh, we're, we're not expecting you to solve all the problems. Um, you've done quite a lot already, but do you have any kind of thoughts or maybe next steps or how can we in par parallel make sure the models are created, are accessible, are very user friendly and at the same time building this kind of dialogue through these tools with all the those involved in these public health problems. So I, I, I just wanted to add, uh, uh, coming back from your comment, Marianne, and then building on Bilal's, was that we can be really innovative in this space. We don't have to stick with a model which says um, there's some rain, there's some mosquitoes, they get infected, they're going to bite people, they're going to get infected, they're going to get sick in a very linear way. I, those are relevant, of course, and they can be incredibly useful if they're if they're built uh, um, uh, correctly. But there are also models that will infect uh, that will be really important for infectious disease planning, around um, integrating the, for instance, how um, the climate works in a region. Will you have epidemics all over the region, or will they tend to be in one place? That actually has lots of implications for resource management, for people, for staff, for the logistics. Will the roads actually be passable if you have really heavy rainfall? So you can think of different tools that will all serve the objective of integrating climate into infectious disease uh, modeling for the purpose of control and saving lives. Another opportunity is to thinking about how, how effective was our program? Uh, we've invested X amount of resources to build a program. How effective is that program uh, when we have a very wet year or when we have a very dry year? It actually changes the accounting of the delivery and the impact of the investments. So I just like the, the, the audience to really think out of the box a little bit about the types of models that would be really helpful in the infectious disease space. I'll throw in that, and I'm probably not meant to give away the game completely, that this is the first in <laughs> a series of investments that the Wellcome Trust is going to be making in this specific space. Um, so within the next couple of months, we're hoping to announce uh, two more things that are maybe not equally as big, but quite large, um, that speak to this idea of we need to build a community of practice around climate sensitive infectious disease modeling. 
Um, mm. we, we, you can't, I, I haven't figured out yet how you could build a capacity building tool that you could then deliver to every corner of the world. What you need to do is enfranchise the community to spread the good word um, once they've figured out what good looks like and how we support the community to continue to grow itself and achieve independence is a model I would rather support. And that's something that we're going to be making an announcement about shortly. Equally, as Madeline just said, thinking about the evaluation of the tools already being used and the tools that are being spun up around the world. Do we really have a good answer? Uh, do we have a good and robust framework for how we answer those questions? Maybe, maybe not, but could it do with more investment? I'm sure everyone would agree that yes, it's the answer. Um, so again, th this is the first step in a hopefully long journey that we're all gonna take together. So watch this space. We will definitely. <laughs> without fail. And uh, while you were uh, speaking, Bilal, well, previously, so Julio DeLeo from Stanford University, working a lot on schistosomiasis, has posted a lot of questions and comments. So Julio, hello, and you must be applying, okay? <laughs> we're looking out for your application. Julio was also writing. I'm sure you know that Stanford's natural Capital Project has a tremendous experience in connecting knowledge to action and developing tools that are useful in the decision-making process. Uh, and also from India, Dr. Bibian Duduta um, was just flagging a recent uh, study entitled Landscape Epidemiological Modeling of Vector Habitat Disease Transmission and Risk Assessment Using Earth Observation, Satellite and Clinical Data. So some very interesting and exciting projects and thank you for sharing that. Um, just a slightly more specific question. We had two colleagues, uh, Mohammed, Mohammed Habib was asking specifically whether there were models you could uh, flag or recommend regarding snails and schistosomiasis. And earlier on, there was also a question about uh, whether you had covered soil transmitted helminths um, in your initial kind of landscaping. Um, it didn't seem to appear on the table. Perhaps that just came under the uh, soil-borne infections. So I can I can speak specifically to the you know have I have our list of key terms that we used. Um, <laughs> we boiled it down to a series of these CSIDs, as I've now started calling the climate sensitive infectious diseases. And indeed, there's some there's some helminthy things on there, and there's schisto on there. And it's simply that as we went through the sort of the categorization of what are the tools and what are the criteria that we can find in the open literature um, and I've flagged that for a second and so as you know as we sort of step down that may be why they're not in the final set um, also to note that a few a few really sort of relevant things came out after our literature search was done um, and so I think I think the climate health community is moving towards making these more platformed which is wonderful um, and sort of picking up on those what is actually the ideal tool so if I'm an agency person how do I go and find that tool? You know, what what am I doing to go and look for it? So that whole question about sort of accessible and named turned out to be super important. Um, so yeah, <laughs> does that is there is there more more answers for that? Brilliant, thank you. I can jump in on Judy because I saw there was a question also about forecasting beyond the seasonal outlook. I think there we we were referring to the fact that most of the models, the tools that we identified were focused on the seasonal time scale. Few models forecasted further out, for example, looking at uh, interannual climate events like El Niño and La Niña events and effects on certain kinds of disease outcomes or long term climate change effects. We found few tools that looked at long term climate change effects on specific health outcomes. And I think this is where especially Sadie was highlighting the importance of those sorts of tools to be able to support decision making in zones of potential disease emergence, where risk may uh, may already be increasing or is projected to increase in the you know, short to medium term. And to sort of circle back on that point, that then leads us to think about this question of where do you do surveillance in places you haven't yet been alerted to epidemics that are regularly surveilled for? And I think that's a sort of, it's a, a nuance on early warning systems that sort of early onset warning systems. If we want to sort of inform surveillance, we need to be thinking about where those sort of leading edges going to be as a way of setting up, you know, the motivation to allocate the resources as Madeline pointed out, you need to know you want to allocate resources. Um, and so I think, I think that sort of, 
it was it was an interesting thing that came out of looking at these multiple scales of time as well as space. Um, I will I will pass the floor back again. It's lots of good questions. Would anyone like to add to um, Sadie's comments? I wanted to jump in, kind of looping back to the previous comment about capacity. And so it's not only building capacity, which I think we all agreed to, but also working with your partners from the beginning to understand where the current capacities are. So you don't want to create a tool that is not able to be implemented. You know, work with existing platforms, existing infrastructure, and then see how we can incrementally strengthen or, or improve those, those platforms that, that may already be usable and, and adaptable. Uh, and also how we can work across uh, this community of climate and health to provide the, those opportunities to strengthen capacity. And so I want to take this opportunity also to mention for those especially who are working in the Latin America region, we have partnered uh, at the II with the Pan American Health Organization and with the Global Consortium on Climate Health Education, which is housed at Columbia University, um, to launch a five-week course on for climate and health first responders in Latin America with speakers and experiences from the region. That course is open, it's open for registration, it's free, and those who complete the course will be able to receive a certificate. So there are lots of initiatives like that that are bubbling up and we are working to draw on the tremendous experience that already exists in, around the world so that we can, we can create tools also that I think best support and reflect uh, the realities in, in unique regions, for example, in Latin America. So I'd just like to add something that I think um, is important in the uptake of uh, new tools and, and data, and that is the idea of ownership. And I think that's what comes from the co-creation. Co and, and what I've seen is that you might have excellent models producing beautiful maps uh, that are presented in a very nice way to national decision makers. And then they will turn to their own community and say, their own national community, and say, well, what do you have to offer? And they would actually much rather go with what their own scientists can develop because they have the buy-in, they know the community, that's their long-term investment. And so the co-creation allows the political connection to the products in a way that bringing something in from the outside doesn't. And so you can see like, you know, a lot of different modeling tools being presented to decision makers, but they just don't make that connection to their own priorities or their own actual scientific community. And I think that's that's why you need to build things in and you need to build the scientists in as well as the policymakers at the local level. That's wonderful. And um, interestingly, it echoes uh, very much coming from the neglected tropical disease side of things, the move at WHO itself um, over the next kind of de decade to make um, much more of a results-driven process, as you started off by uh, telling us all about, Madeline, at the start of your presentation. And also this um, uh, cooperation and local ownership is very, very important. Um, so we've had some more questions, perhaps one that uh, I, I might rephrase slightly. Uh, interesting point made by Gert van Awera. And it's kind of the, I suppose, the recurring question about climate modeling and long-term horizons. Um, how accurate can those be? Does that even matter in the sense that, that uh, it's also the exercise, the policy framework, and also the collaborations along the way that are important? Um, how can we balance the uncertainty versus um, kind of the the predictions of a model? Can I not answer the question? Can, can I, I, not can I step in there just to put some first ideas? I think that's a really, really, yeah, that's a really, really important question. And it's connecting the time frame of the modeling exercise with the time frame of the type of decision. So if you go to a national a malaria control program uh, and you say we want to develop a model for what you might need to do in 20 years time they are not going to be very interested um, if you go to the community which engages the malaria community that are thinking about the national adaptation plans 
and are therefore part of a much broader policy shift, um, then you can hey, maybe have a discussion. And it's more to do with how should we understand that shift? And what's the relevance for the particular outcome that you're interested in? So when you have diseases uh, such as schisto, et cetera, which are very much uh, associated with what the development of water infrastructure, um, then you might start thinking, well, over the long term, this is our plans for water infrastructure development in country X. This is going to have implications for uh, associated diseases. We can start thinking about ways of building in to that process opportunities to manage those risks. So you do really need to tailor the time frame to the decision context. And uh, so um, and, and that's why the co-creation piece is, is, again, comes back to that. And of course, there's a lot of uncertainty in every every prediction about tomorrow, even, you know, it's a sort of it, it's we don't know. And if you think about uh, predicting financial markets or predicting political processes or predicting climate, there's you're never going to have a perfect prediction tool that kind of doesn't make sense scientifically. So what you're having to do is think about what are the risks and where they're emerging from? To what extent is climate a significant risk for this particular problem? And how do we build that risk assessment into the decision making uh, process such that you can maximize targeting, et cetera, uh, of, your pro of your approach? So, um, yeah, if we understand it rather than delivering a tool with a specific number at the end of it, but how does this change the risk in this environment and who needs to understand that risk, uh, that shift in risk, et cetera, then I think you're more likely to come up with a tool that will engage uh, decision makers at a certain level. Everybody on the on the policy front, they always want a yes, no. But that yes, no has to be couched in a risk context. Otherwise, it kind of, yeah, uh, doesn't really make sense. Absolutely. And uh, I, I did slightly modify Gert's question. So if anyone wanted to go in the Q&A and kind of look more specifically at that, then please do go ahead. Um, again, Raleo Emanuel is just highlighting that uh, he's interested in the tools for African trypanosomiasis and onchocerciasis, but the capacity building interface is imperative for indigenous team members. So we've, we have uh, talked, spoken about that. Um, Dr. Dutta is asking about any research related to the effect of El Nino and vector-borne diseases, quite a lot out there. So maybe if uh, you want to be in touch sort of post-webinar uh, on, on those issues, I'm sure our uh, speakers would be more than happy to uh, exchange some information. But I can see we're drawing towards the end of um, the time allocated for our meeting today. And so at this point, I would probably ask you for any final thoughts or words of encouragement. Obviously, everyone on the call should think very seriously, if not of applying, but of at least reshaping their approaches to draw, as you all explained quite clearly, on you know, any disease that has a seasonality aspect to it, to really think in those climate change terms. A climate is going to have a huge impact, undeniably, on infectious diseases. Uh, over the next century, without a doubt. But I'll hand over to our speakers for some final thoughts. My final thought is that there should be an, an equity component in all the work that we do and how we can think about um, who, who is currently experiencing the greatest impact of climate change on their health and who is involved in the process and who will be the beneficiaries of the tools that are created. So if we can keep those questions in mind, I think we'll be on the right track. I think that's an absolutely brilliant one to end on. What I will try to add um, is that when we encourage people to be creative and innovative, what I want people to take away from that is that that doesn't mean you need to add complexity. Um, I am more than happy for you to create something that is two lines of code if it addresses an important question um, that addresses a clear need from the policy community um, and will save a million lives. I could care less if it's got a fancy user interface. If it does the job, it doesn't need to be any more complicated than it than is entirely necessary. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, final comment for me is that absolutely thrilled to um, uh, be engaged with you in this discussion. Our, basically, our success is your success. So we really look forward to seeing uh, the proposals uh, coming in and uh, just what the response is, um, you know, across, right across the board and, and what types of innovations and approaches that you, that you want to take. Sadie, final thoughts? My thoughts are really, it's been incredibly eye-opening to be engaged in this kind of work and it's been wonderful to work with Welcome Trust on this. And I would also conclude on that note as well, that Welcome Trust is an immense and incredible partner um, and in this field and particularly neglected tropical diseases, infectious diseases and um, we can't think of anyone better, really, to push forward uh, this agenda on an advocacy level, but also on a very practical, um, wonderful, supportive aspect in terms of the tools involved. So it's been a great session. Um, kind of the thank yous and the compliments are flooding in on the chat. Uh, I couldn't agree more. It's been a hugely informative session, very interesting and eye opening, whether you're already working in the climate field or not. And so just kind of as a conclusion, I'd like once again to thank everyone who tuned in today and a very big thank you to our speakers. We are definitely watching this space and don't forget application close at the end of March and uh, lots of participants have very kindly posted links on the chat uh, to all of the reports and the resources and uh, the application process itself. So. Rolayo says that um, great presentation, Team Welcome Trust. Thank you. And thank you to all of you.